thankful that you have joined us on tonight for Bible study. Please share the video with your family and friends. Our scripture tonight comes from John 15, verses 13 through 17. And it reads, There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends since I have told you everything the Father told me. Verse 16 says, you didn't choose me. I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. Verse 17, this is my command, love each other. Have you ever thought about what the world needs? What the world needs now is love. We are to love each other as Jesus loved us. And he loved us enough to give his life for us. If we have been born again, Jesus Christ is our Lord and Master. He has the right to call us slaves, servants, but instead he regards us as friends. Jesus not only chose us, but he also wants us to be his friends. Because he is our Lord and Master, we owe him our complete obedience and should listen to everything he says. Because we are his friends, we should love him and others the way he loves us. Jesus made the first choice. He chose to love us. He chose to die for us. He chose to invite us to come and live with him forever. We make the next choice. And that's the choice to accept or reject his offer. Without Jesus' choice, we would have no choice to make. So if you have not made the next choice to accept Jesus today, we offer Christ to you right now. God will do it for you. What he did for me, he'll do it for you. If you seek Jesus with your whole heart, the Lord will give you the desire of your heart. So accept Jesus today. Don't leave earth without him. So we offer Christ to you. My brother, my sister, he'll give you a brand new life. Accept him today. Give you brand new life. New 
Father God in heaven, it's in the name of Jesus of Christ we come. God, we thank you for the privilege. We thank you for the another opportunity. We thank you for blessing us and keeping us. We thank you, Lord, for all that you do, all that you have done, and what you're doing right now. Lord, we thank you, Father God, that you are the magnificent God. You're the one who keeps us and blesses us. Lord, you're the one, Father God, that watches over us. And for that, Lord, we're thankful. God, we thank you for another privilege to enter into your word, to be blessed by your word, to be trained by your word, to be taught by your word. For we realize, Father God, your word is a light and a lamp. Father God, we ask you to bless us. We ask you, Father God, to forgive us for our sins. Bless us that nothing hinder us from hearing your word, from believing your word. We pray, Father God, that we accept your word just as it is written. We ask you to bless me now as I unveil your word. I decrease me, Father God, and increase the word of God. It's in Jesus' name we pray and we ask it all. Amen. Thank God. We offer Christ. for Christ to you tonight. We thank you for attending tonight our Bible study. Thank you again for attending our Bible study here at our remote location. Thank you for joining the New Beginning Church. Thank you so much for being a part. Tonight we are in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And tonight tonight's lesson will come from verses 14 through 22. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verses 14 through 22 is where we are tonight. We started on this pericope on last week, and in this particular pericope, the Apostle Paul is admonishing, is exhorting the church at Thessalonica and giving them some directions as to how to live their lives as Christians. So he continued along this path tonight. Last week, he talked about how he urged uh, people to recognize those who labor among them, those who are leaders, those who are deacons, elders, those who are pastors, teachers, and preachers. He said, whatever you do, recognize them. In other words, appreciate, appreciate them. In other words, make sure you respect them and know their hearts. The Apostle Paul said uh, through verses 12 and 13 on last week, we said to you that these men labor in the word of God. They labor for you and they labor over God's word. He says, admonish, he admonished them to always hold these men in high esteem. He says, very highly in love, he admonished them for his, their work's sake because of their work, because of what they do for the Lord, because of what they do for you, hold them in high esteem, hold them in love. Apostle Paul went on to say, be at peace among yourselves. <laughs> Make sure you honor the leaders for their work's sake, and whatever you do, be at peace among yourselves. In other words, get along with each other. Make sure whatever you do, you make sure that you get along with each other. So we ought to get along with the preachers. And then in this, this, these verses 12 and 13, he says, hold these leaders in high regard. He says, whatever you do, be affectionately, uh, uh, continually blessing them, affectionately respecting them, and have great value for them. And he says in these two verses, make sure that you continue this type of situation over and over and over again. Make it a lifestyle. So we pick up at verse number 14 tonight, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 14 through 22. We pick up at verse 14 tonight. He says, now we exhort you, 
He says that we exhort you, we, we, we ask of you, we beg of you, we, we pray that you would follow these next few instructions. He says, now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly. The Apostle Paul knew that in the church of Thessalonica, that they had some people that was just out of control. He says, warn those admonish them, call it to their attention, put it in their mind, warn those, rep reprove them. This word warn means to reprove and put in mind. Make sure you warn them. You see, some people just need to be warned. They need to be warned. They need to be, be it needs to be called to their mind, the direction that they're going in. He says, warn those who are unruly. Warn those who are unruly. Those who are unruly are those who are insubordinate. Those who are unhinged and unarranged. Remember now, this is a part of the pericope that we began on last week. Verses 12 and 13 is a part of this same pericope. He talks about bless those and respect those who have leadership over you in verses 12 and 13 hold them in high esteem. And then he says, warn those who are not doing these things. He says, warn those who are insubordinate. You don't have any insubordinate people in your congregation, do you? Paul says here, those who are unruly are insubordinate. In other words, they do not support as he asks us to in verses 12 and 13. They do not obey. They do not follow. They do not get involved in leadership uh, with the leadership as they should, and they are not even respected, respectable of the leadership. He says, whatever you do, uh, make sure that you hold them in high esteem for their work's sake, and not only that, warn those who are not doing these things. You know, it just becomes a part of the congregation when someone else warn somebody that's going in the wrong direction, that's always pushing uh, against the grain, whatever vision comes up, I ain't going with that. It becomes imperative for other members to call them on the carpet. It becomes important for other members to say, stop acting like that. You acting crazy now. It becomes imperative for other members in the congregation to say, stop being insubordinate, stop being unruly. I'm warning you, something gonna go on with you that is not what you want to happen. So you need to understand that it's our responsibility as members to warn other members who are out of control, unhinged, other members that are, are not going in the right, the right direction. Make sure that we call it to their attention, Paul says. Paul goes on to say, verse number, number 14, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14, the next thing he says is to comfort the faint-hearted. To comfort the faint-hearted. To comfort the faint-hearted. In other words, encourage those who are struggling. It comfort the faint-hearted. This word faint-hearted means the feeble-minded, the faint in spirit, those who are faint-hearted. He says, encourage them. Every now and then people get down and out. Every now and then people do not uh, do do not interpret things the right way. And when they don't interpret it the right way, they get feeble in their mind. They get they get weak in their heart. They get weak in their spirit. He says to us tonight, whatever you do, comfort them. This word comfort means to, to instruct them in encouragement. Whatever you do, encourage the faint-hearted, those who are, who are just, just going uh, astray out of their mind. They are weak. They, they have little spirit. They are not encouraged. He's saying to us, encourage them. He moves and says, uphold the weak. Uphold the weak. The word uphold means to support. Support the weak. This word weak here uh, is, is, the, is the ones who are, are strengthless. 
they are strengthless. They have very little strength or no strength. It is the same word we get the word impotency from, impotency, impotency. They are weak. They have no power. They have little power. They are without strength. You see, the God we serve is an is a omnipotent God. He is an omnipotent God. He has all power. He says here, whatever you do, those who are weak, those who are powerless, those who are impotent, help to strengthen them, help to bring them along. Don't talk about how weak they are. Go ahead and get involved with them and strengthen them. Pick them up. If they're down and out, you ought to be strengthening them. You ought to pick them up. You ought to be the one that encouraged them to come on. You can do this. Uh, several athletes have been running against each other and have been playing and participating against each other. But when one falls, the other athlete, which is the opponent, reaches down and picks up his or her opponent. Let me tell you, the church ought to be that way. First of all, we are not in opposition with each other. We are not opponents to each other. We are on the same team. We're working for the same master. We're trying to do what we do for the same Lord. We ought to uphold the weak. Build them up. They're already torn down. The world has torn them down. The world has messed them up. The world is beating them up. It is our place to uphold the weak, to support the weak, to bear up the weak. Be patient, he says, with all. Let me just share with you. Some people you just got to be patient with. <laughs> Some people you just got to be patient with them. And, and not only that, do you have to be patient with them, you have to be long-suffering. You have to endure them. This word patient is the same word, same Greek word we get the word endurance. So we have to endure people. We have to forbear them. We have to make sure that we are long suffering with them. And let me tell you something. The reason why we need to be cognizant, be cognizant of being long suffering with other people is because God was long suffering with us. God has suffered long with us. And if God suffered long with us, we ought to be able to suffer, suffer long with other people. He says, whatever you do, endure them. Be patient. Be patient and endure them. Verse number 15. See that no one, render, no one renders evil for evil to anyone. Do not render evil for evil. Do not render, do not deliver, do not even yield, and don't reward evil for evil. If someone does something evil to you, you best, better just forgive them. Just forgive them, move on. Don't render evil for evil. Don't go back and forth with that person. Don't give them evil because they gave you evil. Do not render evil for evil. And, and evil, evil, this word evil means to do harm, to hurt, to, to, to be wicked against. And let me tell you, there are some people who are wicked that are doing wicked things. Paul says, don't be wicked toward them. Don't give them wickedness when they give you wickedness. Don't give them bad when they give you bad. The apostle Paul says to us tonight, he says, whatever you do, don't harm them. Don't wish ill will on them. Jesus says like this, pray for your enemies. Do good to those who despitefully use you. Whatever you do, don't render evil for evil. Mm -hmm. When they render evil to you, you render good to them. Miss right. Obama would say, say it like this. Michelle Obama says, when they go low, we go high. Let me just share with you. When they hit you low, you have to stand up and not go low with them. You have to make sure you don't render evil for evil. He's already saying, warn the unruly. Tell them where they're going wrong. But do not render evil for evil. Don't get back at anybody. God says, 
vengeance is mine. And if you didn't know it, he says, says the Lord of hosts. Vengeance belongs to the God. Do not uh, take vengeance on the other people. He says, Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 15, Paul says, see that no one render evil for evil to anyone else. Now, he's not talking to people on the street. He's not talking to winos. He's not talking to dope, dope dealers. He's not talking to prostitutes. He, he's talking to church people. He's talking to Christians. Mm -hmm. And he's saying to Christians, don't render evil for evil. Do good to people. God has a vengeance plan. And his plan is better than your plan. Yes. He says, do not render evil for evil to anyone. He says, all of you, make sure you don't render evil for evil. But pursue what is good, both for yourselves and for all. He says, pursue that which is good. He, he says to us tonight, whatever you do, Go after that which is good. Follow that which is good. Whatever you do, as you do unto any man, do good as you would do good for yourself. Look at what he says. He says, but always pursue. Always follow. Always look out for that which is good. Always look and press toward that which is good. Pursue what is good, both to yourself or for yourself and for all. It says to you tonight, don't be so bitter until you become selfish. Don't get so bitter. There are people who've been bitter for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, and the person that you're bitter with is gone on down the road. They're either making somebody else's life bitter or they're just living their, li their lives and you still bitter against them. Jesus says, forgive. The word says, move on. He says tonight, Paul says, don't be selfish about it. Pursue what is both, pursue that which is good, both for yourself and for other folk. Matter of fact, he says, and that is good for all. Not just you, not just your family, not just your friends, not just your buddies, not just your cronies, but for all. So we have to create an atmosphere that is good for everybody. You know, it's, it's amazing to me how people can go throughout their entire lives living their lives just for themselves. And they don't live their lives for anybody else. They, don't, they, they get it all for themselves. And many times, they live miserable lives. Let me just say to you today, your worst enemy, pray for them. Yes. Let me just say to you tonight, whatever you do, pursue good for yourself and for other men, other women, other boys, other girls. Whatever you do, don't be selfish about it. He says, don't be selfish about it. He says, pursue good and not evil. Don't render evil for evil. Don't get back at anybody and, and don't look to get back at it. But pursue means to run after, to follow. Pursue that which is good, both for yourself and for all men. All need means you don't leave anybody out. He says, whatever you do, make sure you pursue what is good, both for yourselves and for all other men also. Verse 16 says, rejoice always. Rejoice. Rejoice. This, this word means God's speed. It, it means to have great joy. It, it, this word means to be full of cheer. Be happy. Be well off. Now, being well off, being happy and rejoicing and being glad doesn't necessarily mean that everything is going well in your life. In the midst of those things that are going wrong, you still need to rejoice always. When, when, you, when you have, when you, you jump back up to verses 12 through verse number 15, it's, it's instructing us to don't render evil for evil. It's instructing us to, to make sure that we don't become like the unruly. 
And he says, rejoice always. When things are not going well, still rejoice. How much better your life would be if you could just rejoice in everything that takes place. If you could only just rejoice. If you could only just have joy. If you could only be glad about it. If you could only say to yourself, I have God's speed, God's support. And when you have God's speed and God's support, you need to understand that you need to rejoice always. Rejoicing always is not predicated on your life being everything you want it to be. Rejoicing is that you have joy in the middle of a storm. I say all the time to the New Beginning Church members that you understand that God can calm the storm. But many times, God chooses not to calm the storm. He calms the child in the midst of the storm. God wants you to be calm in the storm. In the midst of death, in the midst of tragedy, in the midst of destitute, in the midst of divorce, in the midst of child abuse, God wants to be with you so he can keep you calm. Yeah. You need to understand that this word rejoice means that you must have a calming happiness in the midst of a storm. Let me tell you, we're in the midst of a storm like never before. We have never seen a storm like we're in the midst of now. Yeah. But people are watching Christians and they're trying to see if Christians are going to be calm in the storm or are Christians going to fall to pieces like everybody else? Mm -hmm. Let me tell you, if you're born again, you are a Christian. If you're born again, you are a Christian, yes. meaning that you are obligated to be Christ-like. And if you're not Christ-like in the midst of a storm, then other, a watching world is watching you a waiting world that's waiting to see something good come after you. If you're not getting what you've been praying for year after year after year after year, people are watching you to see if your faith going to hold up. Yes, God. If you haven't gotten it, you keep praying and praying and you still haven't gotten it. Are you upset with God? Mm -hmm. Have God given you a raw deal? Are you bitter because God has not brought that one into your life, whether it is a child or a man or a woman, if it's somebody that you've been waiting to see and God had not delivered it to you, are you bitter because of that? <laughs> are you rejoicing? Because you know God has it under control. You know God has things in the middle mm -hmm. and he's dealing with it behind the scene. Yeah. When God doesn't show his face, you trust him enough to know that he's working it out yes. behind the scene. Yes, God is at work. And he's at work all around us. Henry, Back Henry Back Backaby, Blackaby says it like this. God is at work all around us. We need to look to see where God is at work and jo join in where God is at work. Yes. And then and only then can we experience who God is. We have to stop crying in our soup. We have to stop throwing pity parties on everything that happens. We have to look to see where God is at work and join God in where he's at work. And as we join God where he's at work, then we will experience God like never before. But as long as we're selfish and as long as we're waiting on God to deliver us, as long as we are doing the things that, that we are supposed to do and God still had an answer, we need to still trust him. That's right. The psalmist says it like this. He asked the question when the Israelites were, were in captivity. How can we sing in a strange land? We have to learn to sing God's song in the strange land. That's right. So we have to rejoice. We have to be, be able to to have joy and pleasure with, without things going our way. Paul says to the church at Thessalonica, whatever you do, rejoice evermore. Rejoice always. Rejoice in any situation. Rejoice in any circumstance. We have to get to a point where, 
where we can rejoice in the middle of it. And let me share with you. You have to accept when things are not right. Don't, don't get so spiritual until you see we're in the midst of a, a troubled time and don't acknowledge it. You have to acknowledge it and then you pray about it. That's my next point. When we look at verse 16, he says, rejoice. Verse 17 says, pray without ceasing. Yeah, we're in a tough time. In our tough times, we have to rejoice. In our tough, tough times, we have to rejoice from now on. In our tough times, we have to rejoice forevermore. And while we're in the midst of rejoicing, we ought to also pray. We ought to pray. This word pray means to supplicate. It means to feel your prayers from deep down within. This word pray means to cry out to the awesome and almighty God. This word pray means to communicate with God. And prayer is not a monologue. Prayer is a dialogue. And as you have a dialogue with God, that means you talk to God and you wait and hear what God has to say to you. Pray, supplicate. It means to agonize in prayer. I'm not talking about, Lord, lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Let me just share with you. If your soul has not been taken by the Lord before you go to sleep, you don't have to worry about it being taken after you sleep. You need to be saved before you go to sleep. You need to be saved before you fall into death. You need to be saved and born again. That's why when you pray, you communicate with God and you allow God to communicate with you. This word prayer means to supplicate. It means to, to agonize in your prayer. How many times have you really agonized and told God about your situation and asked God to bless it? And ask God, without you moving a finger, without you trying to fix it yourself, you trusting in God. Not only does it mean to supplicate, it means to worship. So here we are, we are rejoicing in the midst of our trouble. Here we are, we are praying in the midst of our trouble. Right. And this word prayer means to worship. Mm -hmm. Praise your way through. Push your way through. Honor God as you go through. Whatever you do, make sure you worship. This word prayer means to worship God. Have you ever worshiped him in your prayer? Mm -hmm. Jesus says when we pray, we ought to begin by praising and worshiping him. Right. Okay. Jesus says, and, 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 and he says it very clearly in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says when you pray, you begin by saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. He says, God, we honor your name. Right. We praise your name. We worship you because you are God. We bless you because your name. You ought to worship God. And you ought to worship him in prayer to, to a point where you're not in a hurry to get to ask him for something. Mm -hmm. You ought to have a prayer time, just you and God, talking to him, allowing him to talk to you, and you ask him for nothing. Okay. Just say, Lord, I, I worship you. I praise you. Lord, 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 I thank you. Lord, I bless your name. I thank you that you're glorious. I thank you that you are mighty. Thank you, God, for who you are and what you do. Thank you, God, for, for just being there. Thank you for just being around. Thank you for the privilege, Lord, of communicating with you and communing with you. Let me tell you, it's a privilege to be able to commune with God. Amen. There are people that are in the hospital and they're being taken care of real well, but I'd rather communicate with God. There are people in jail and they're clean jails and they get three square meals a day, but I'd rather commune with God. There are people who live in penthouses and, and they look down and they look around and they see people beneath them, both physically and socially, but I'd rather be in the presence of God. That's why the psalmist say, I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than, than to have all his stuff. Forget about stuff and concentrate on God. If you got something that, that you are talking to God about, you just get in tune with God. Because there's one thing about it, God has it. Yes. And if God has it, you need to be in communication with him. You need to walk with him. You need to talk with him. Dr. Charles Stanley tells a story about when he grew up, he walked with his grandfather uh, along the pasture fence. 
And his grandfather just talked to him and communicated with him and, and told him right from wrong. And now, years later, he is regurgitating what his grandfather taught him. That's how it is with God. As we walk with God, God blesses us and God keeps us. As we walk with God, God mentors us. As we walk with God, God blesses us to the point where we know what to do when, when we don't feel like God's around. Have you ever felt like God is not present? But if you pray, supplicate and worship him. This word pray means to worship him. And he says, and in verse number 17, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17, he said, do it without ceasing. Worship God without ceasing. Don't look at what appears before you. Because if you keep watching what's before you, you will never, you will never worship him. But what you have to do is make sure you worship him, praise him, rejoice in his presence, even when things are not right. This church at Thessalonica was going through some stuff and things were not always right. And Paul has the nerve, the audacity, the gall to say, Pray without ceasing. In other words, worship him, supplicate unto him without ceasing, meaning do it always and do it continuously. Verse number 18, in everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Verse 18 says that in everything give thanks, in everything be grateful, <laughs> In everything. No, we're not grateful that we're sick, but in the midst of our sickness, we're grateful. Mm -hmm. my, 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 my father in law used to put it like this be thankful that you can feel the pain, yeah. because when you can't feel the pain, mm -hmm. you're out of here. He says, Thank God that your pain can be felt by you. Be grateful to God that you can feel the pain because when the pain is no longer felt, you out of here. We have to be, be grateful. He says, in all things, in everything, give thanks. In everything, in all things, in every place, in every situation, be grateful to God because this is the will of God. We have to learn to be thankful for the little things and then watch what God does in the big things. God can't trust you to be thankful when you're going through little stuff. How's he going to trust you when to be thankful when you're going through big stuff? You have to learn to be a thankful spirit even when it's not going your way. He says, be thankful in all things, for this is the will. This is the desire of God. This is God's purpose for your life. This word will, God gets pleasure. This word will means pleasure. This word will means desire. This is God's pleasure for your life. He says, be grateful, be thankful. One of the worst things I see in the 21st century that I didn't see so much in the 20th century is that we got a bunch of unthankful, unthoughtful young folk. Wow. They're not thankful for anything. And I always go back to the story of a little, a, a 21 year old, 22 year old boy. Parents bought him a car for his graduation, and it was a BMW. Now, many of us would wish that somebody gave us, bought us a BMW. He took the car and purposely drove it off in the back by you, and they show video of a car floating down the river. He purposely drove it into the waters, drove it into the bayou, and looked at his parents and said, I asked you for a Mercedes and you bought me a BMW. He grew up in the wrong household. First of all, if he grew up in my daddy's household, he wouldn't be driving a BMW anyway. Secondly, if you get something, if somebody gives you something, if somebody blesses you with something, be grateful and thankful for it. Mm -hmm. Paul says, it is the will of God that you be thankful and give thanks and have gratitude. Be grateful in all things. 
he says, give thanks. In everything, give thanks. And how many things? Everything gives thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. And it is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. See, some people have come to the conclusion that what God says in his word is for somebody else. <laughs> it's like the husband, the wife, the child that goes to church and come back and said, the preacher sure was preaching to you today. <laughs> the word of God is for all of us. And we ought to be thankful. And even members ought to be thankful when the preacher challenges in them in the word. If you're, if you're physical, your physical body, your mental state is challenged in the word. You ought to be thankful in Christ Jesus. He says, be thankful in Christ Jesus, for this is the will of God concerning you. Be thankful in Christ Jesus. Don't run over the word in. This word in is, is a positional word. It means that we are positioned through Christ Jesus. It means that our motion depends on Christ Jesus. It means that we are set apart, we are separated through Christ Jesus, and we have benefits that others don't have because we have Jesus. <laughs> this word, this word in, don't pass over it now. It means by Christ Jesus. It means with Christ Jesus. It means through Christ Jesus. In other words, we got it going on, not because of our education, not because of who we are, but we got it going on because of Christ Jesus. The word Christ, the, the word Christ is, is the anointed one. The word Jesus is God's only begotten son, his only one of a kind, his only unique son. Christ Jesus is the reason why we can rejoice. And if we have Christ Jesus, we have the ability to rejoice. Now, we may not rejoice because we're throwing pity parties, but we have the ability to rejoice. And it only comes through Christ Jesus. The only way we can rejoice in trouble, the only way we can rejoice in everything, the only way we can rejoice continuously is that we have Christ Jesus. <clears throat> This is the desire of God concerning us. This is God's desire. This is God's pleasure concerning us. Verse 19, he says, do not quench <laughs> the Holy Spirit. Do not shut down. Do not extinguish. This word quench means to extinguish the Holy Spirit. This word quench, this word quench means don't, don't blockade the Holy Spirit. Don't turn a blind eye or turn your back to the Holy Spirit. Let me share with you. Many times we turn away from what God is doing in our lives. We quench the Holy Spirit. Some people have equated it to heartburn. It's not heartburn. It's the Holy Spirit moving upon you. If you say the Holy Spirit is constantly talking to you, and as he talks to you, don't extinguish him. Do not put him out. And I say he and him. He is the third person of the triune God. Quench not the Holy Spirit. Don't turn him off. Don't turn him out. Don't turn your back on him. Yes. Quench not the Holy Spirit. In other words, as the Spirit of God speaks to you, then you ought to hear from him. It ties right into to the next verse, verse number 20. Do not despise prophecies. Now, let me just share with you today. During that period, there were people coming up with all kind of conspiracies. <laughs> That's a good word for it. They came up with all kinds of stuff. And men thought they were spiritual. And because they thought they were spiritual, some people would buy into it but others would not. Look at verse number 21. Test all things, hold fast to that which is good. He says to us, don't quench the Holy Spirit. Don't quench the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Don't, don't get upset because somebody prophesies 
some things. Now, Paul is talking to the church in, a, in another dispensation, and he's saying to them, whatever you do, do not despise prophecies. And at that time, they had prophecies of the future and prophecies of the present. During these days, we have prophecies, and our prophecies are found in God's word. I heard a lady talking, and she called it preaching, but I heard a lady talking on the radio, and she made the statement that make sure you obey the Holy Spirit because he will tell you sometimes, sometimes he will tell you stuff that's not in the word. Oh, it was time for me to turn. I don't know who she was, but it was time for me to leave that station. And that's what I did. When there's a prophecy made, in the 20th and the 21st century, it must line up with the word of God. If it does not line up with the word, it is not of the Holy Spirit. It is not of Jesus Christ, and it is not of God. It says, do not quench the Holy Spirit. Do not quench the Spirit of God. Do not quench the Spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Don't turn your back on prophecies. But he says, if you hear prophecy, test all things. Try all things. He says, prove all things. He says to us, test. The word test means prove. The word test means to try. He says, try all things. If it doesn't line up with the word, if it does not uh, sit well with God's word, it ought not sit well with you. And you ought to always try it by God's word. There are a lot of people prophesying a lot of things these days. I call it prophet lying instead of prophesying. There are a lot of people, and they will come and tell you uh, that, that this is going to happen. I remember when we first built the church, New Beginning Church. Guy said to me, man, the Lord's telling me that, that you, you may have 40 now, but come the end of this year, you'll have 600. <laughs> I mean, it sounds good. It, 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 it puts goosebumps all over you, but I didn't hear a word of it, and I haven't seen a word of it, because at the end of the day, God is the one who gives the increase. Yeah. And not only that, some things are not growth when church blow up. Some things are not growth. Some things are bulges. Some, some things that we call growth is just an infection. And because when new people come, and we all want new people to come, we all want to grow. We all want to talk about how the church is growing and how God is speaking and, and the Holy Spirit is walking through the place. But if it's not of God, I don't want any of it. He says, test all things. Try all things. Prove all things. And the only way to prove it is check it out with the word of God. And then he says, verse 21, he says, Hold fast to that which is good. He says, hold fast. He says, test all things. Hold fast what is good. Hold fast to it. It means just to hang on to it for dear life. Hold fast to it. Stick with it. Possess it. Retain it. Hold fast. To seize the moment. When God is doing something good, you need to seize the moment. And he doesn't do things good unless it lines up with his word. If you had a church, your, your preacher, your teachers ought to line up with the word. Their statements, their prophecies, their, their, their instruction ought to line up with the word. And he says, after you test it, after you prove it, after you put it up against the word, Hold fast to that which is good. Hold fast what, to what is good. See, you have to sift it. You have to sift it through something. You have, to, you have to make sure that you sift it through the word of God. And as you sift it through the word of God, if it does not hold up to the word of God, it's not of God. That's right. Paul says to them, hold fast, withhold, retain, possess, uh, hold on to, 
Keep in your memory. Keep it in your memory, that which is good. See, when all this stuff is coming at you, and everybody got a word these days. Everybody has a prophecy. Everybody want to tell you what's going to happen in your life. You ask them to show it to you in the word of God. If they can't show it to you in the word, just give them 50 feet. Move on down the road. Get back, get back. Because that which is good will come up. In the country, we used to churn butter. And when you churn butter, what it is is a, it's, it's milk that the cow gives off. And you take this spatula, this spatula with a handle on it, and you keep churning. You keep pushing it up and down like a piston. You keep moving it up and down, and the, the cream rises to the top. And, and let me just share, you, share with you something. Whatever is of God is going to rise to the top. Mm -hmm. You just keep churning it through the word of God. Keep moving it and sifting it through the word of God. If it's of God, it's going to rise to the top. Paul says, keep that's what is good. Hold on to that what is good. And so what we would do in the country, we would scrape that which is off on the top, scrape it off, and use that which is good and get rid of that which is bad. Finally, verse number 22, it says, abstain from every form of evil. You see, some things are not evil in and of itself, but it's a form of evil. That's what the psalmist talk about when he says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. The shadow is not death, but it is a form of death. Paul says here, abstain. The word abstain means to get rid of it. <laughs> the word abstain means to refrain, refrain from it. The word abstain means to, to get off from it, get away from it. He says abstain from every form of evil, every appearance. This word form means appearance, every appearance of evil. This word form means appearance. It means fashion. It means shape. It means sight. He says abstain from every form of evil. Abstain from every, every appearance of evil. That which doesn't even look right, get away from it. Yes. Let me tell you, a lot of young men have gotten, gotten caught up. They've gotten caught up because they said, well, nothing is wrong with it. Well, if it doesn't even look right, if it doesn't even shape right, if it doesn't, if it doesn't even look right in my sight, if it's not fashion right, get away from it. Leave, there are some people who who got drug in, <laughs> drug in, who, who have been drug in by what looks good. And then there are other people who have gotten drug in to stuff that didn't even look right. And then get away from the even the appearance of it. No, right. Move away from every form of it. Move from every fashion of it. Anything that is evil, you want to be away from it. You want to, you want to, anything that's bad, move on. It's a good lesson for our young people uh, to, to know and to hear. A good lesson for our young people to hold on to. Get away from it. That's right. And as I talk to you tonight, I'm reminded that we have to get away from the devil. Mm -hmm. Get away from sin. Get away from evil. And I've already said to you tonight, that you can't do it in and of yourself. Mm -hmm. You need Jesus. Right. There may be somebody here tonight who have never tried Jesus, but the text declares you ought to get away from evil. You either got Jesus, which is good. The text declares, hold fast to what is good. The text declares that you need to cling on to it, siege that which is good. Hold fast to that which is good but abstain from that which is evil. I submit to you tonight that you hold fast or you get siege on Jesus. Amen. Jesus, the one who died over 2,000 years ago. Jesus, the one who rose from the dead. God raised him from the dead. I give you this invitation tonight. Believe that Jesus is the son of God. Believe that Jesus died for your sins. Believe that Jesus rose from the dead. 
And then Jesus will help you abstain from evil. Then Jesus will allow you to, to be able to hold fast to that which is right, that which is good. The door of the church is open. This is your moment. The invitation is extended. This is your time to get in touch with Jesus. And you can do it. It's not hard. All you have to do is believe the story. And if you believe this story that Jesus died and rose again, just join me in prayer and invite him into your life. Just repeat after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new creature. Thank you, Jesus, for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and thank God. We believe if you prayed this prayer honestly, believing that Jesus is the Son of God, that he died for your sins and rose from the dead, we believe that you're saved. We believe that you're born again. We believe that when you die, you're going to heaven. We believe that you are a brand new creature. And we believe that in your troubled times, Jesus will be there and you can call on him. There may be others who have fallen short. And oftentimes I say to you, I have fallen short. I have sinned. But I want to remind you tonight that you have fallen short. Even if you are a Christian, you, you mess up sometimes. I want to pray for us. Pray for you. Pray for me. Lord God, I ask you to bless us. Forgive us. Lord, we acknowledge our sins, and whatever sins we've done, we bring them before you. We ask you to forgive us for our sins. Bless us, Father God, that we will turn right back to you. And Lord, we ask you to keep the glory all on and all the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. We believe that Jesus is able to keep us in the midst of trouble. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you for being part of our Bible study. It is offering time. You can give in one or two ways. You can give by post office box or you can give by Zelle. Our post office box is New Beginning Church, P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That's P.O. Box. 503 Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Or you can give by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. The idea is as we lift Jesus, he draw all men unto him. If you need a church home, I welcome you to the New Beginning Church, 4251 Shuramai Road, S C H U R M I E R, 4251 Shuramai Road, Houston, Texas, 77048, USA. Please join us on Sunday morning at 1030. Also join us Sunday morning at 9 a.m. for Bible study. We'll be glad to be a part of you and you'll be a part of our studies. Lord God, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you, Father God, that we are called up by Christ. And we have the ability to rejoice from now on and rejoice in all things. We thank you now. We bless your name. Lord, we pray for those on our prayer list. We ask you to bless, heal. And bless, Father God, that they will be healed in the name of Jesus. We pray, Father God, that you bless those who are bereaved. We pray, Lord, that you bless the sick and the shut-in. We pray, Father God, that you continue to walk with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. Thank you so much for joining us. We here at the New Beginning Church, we are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus says, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men 
unto me. John 12 and 32. For all of you, all of you who uh, were not able to make the graduation in Dallas, Texas, and, and many of you I said to you, let's wait and do it locally. Well, the local graduation is Friday, two days from now at the uh, Holy Trinity Missionary Baptist Church at 7 p.m. If you wanna come and celebrate with us as we uh, go through the ceremony of graduation here locally in Houston, Texas, please come out, Holy Trinity Missionary Baptist Church. The address is 14513 South Post Oak Road, 14513 South Post Oak Road, Houston, Texas, and the zip code is 77045. Thank you again for joining us. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer. Be blessed.